one of the reasons we are able to be confused about diet is because our bodies are so remarkably tolerant. We are natively omnivorous and we are incredibly forgiving machines for a while. Uh, but everybody still eats and most of us do it badly. And so diet is the leading cause of premature death in the United States today. Well, the single leading predictor variable of chronic disease and all cause mortality, as we discussed at the start, is diet quality. That deserves to be a vital sign. We need to know that in everybody. It's too important to neglect. Do we measure it routinely? We do not because we did not historically have the tools to do it. Think of GPS, how incredibly useful it is. We all use it every day. It's fantastic. What does it do? It tells you where you are now. You tell it where you want to go. And it can navigate you from here to there because it knows both here and there. And it can navigate you in a turn list. So, you know, it's not like, okay, here's the general direction, go west, good luck. You know, step by step from here to there. And if you follow those instructions, you will get there and it tracks your progress. We invented that for diet. The response from Dr. Oz Show viewers broke our server. Thousands and thousands of people rushed to our website to, to get access to the tool. Welcome friends. We truly have a special treat in store for you today. A one-on-one -on -one with the esteemed Dr. David L. Katz. Dr. Katz is a preventive medicine specialist and globally recognized authority on lifestyle medicine. He's the founding director of Yale University's Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center, past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, president and founder of the True Health Initiative, and founder and CEO of Diet ID. At last count, Dr. Katz holds a staggering 180 awards, recognitions, organizations, appointments, and honors. He put much of his work aside in 2020 to help with COVID, serving on the front line as a volunteer, and speaking before the U.S. Senate in May. In one of our recent discussions, David shared a game-changing diet technology that he's graciously agreed to talk about with us today. Whether you're a practitioner or simply interested in cutting through all the diet confusion, I think you're really going to enjoy this. Welcome, Dr. Katz. It is just so good to be with you again today. Um, but we talk about a lot of things, but uh, in class, I always t talk about what are the leading causes of diseases. But I think you've done a great job of, of raising up something that we all tend to forget about. And so, so I'll ask you right off the top, what's the number one cause of early death in America? Poor diet. And, and first of all, Scott, thanks. It's great to be back with you as well. And, you know, it, it's sort of stunning um, that something we control, something we produce, something that um, we interact with every day, every one of us, something we expose our children to could be the leading cause of premature death in our country, even during the pandemic, by the way. Uh, but it is. Diet is number one. When, when I started my career in preventive medicine, I, I finished my training in preventive medicine, public health in 1993. And that was the year the paper came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association that positioned diet among the top three causes of premature death in the country. The paper was entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. It was by Mike McGinnis and Bill Fagey, famous paper. I, I think one of the most important papers in the modern literature. Those findings have been replicated many times since. But back in 1993, so almost three decades ago, tobacco was number one, diet was number two, lack of physical activity was number three. And, and those three factors together, but by themselves, accounted for 80% of the premature deaths that occur in this country every year. It's incredible. 80% of the premature deaths in chronic disease would go away if we just fixed what we were doing badly with our feet, our forks, and our fingers. Feet, forks, and fingers, master lovers of medical destiny. Flash forward to the, 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 the current era, and you know, we, we've obviously had strides uh, reducing tobacco exposure in the United States. It's still way too high, but it's much better than it was three decades ago. Uh, but everybody still eats, and most of us do it badly. And so diet is the leading cause of premature death in the United States today. And a good place to get more information about that is an op-ed that was in the New York Times August 26th of last year, 2019, entitled, Our Food is Killing Too Many of Us. It was by Darius Mozafarian, Dean of Nutrition at Tufts, 
and Dan Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture of the United States, and they cite the primary literature establishing poor diet quality as the number one cause of chronic disease and premature death. And then they go on to talk about what we ought to do to fix it. And I imagine we'll do the same. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, you with your colleagues, and I'm sure uh, I know mine, we all have been talking about the, the issues with diet and, and how it relates to disease for a long time. And as we look in, we're here in 2020, and, and while it's, as difficult it is, COVID is teaching us a lot of things, and I think it hopefully is creating some new opportunities. But I, I think what, what many of us would suggest is that it's really, you know, this has been building for about the last 50 years or so, and in terms of, of an underlying issue that no one really wanted to recognize, and COVID really has just pulled the trigger on that. Is that, is that fair to say, do you think? I, well, I, not only is it fair to say, but really in two ways. So first, my, my colleagues who do wildlife conservation or environmental science um, or look at food systems uh, make the case very compellingly that it's a fractured food production system that leads to emerging infectious diseases like COVID in the first place. So, you know, essentially violating fragile ecosystems, mingling domestic animals with wild animals, bringing these so-called zoonotic pathogens and pathogens that are native to other species into human populations. So if we fix global food sourcing, we would be vastly less subject to recurring pandemics in the first place. That's where influenza came from. That's where SARS-CoV-2 came from. That's where our next pandemic will come from. So, uh, you know, in one sense, it pulled the trigger at the very origin of the pandemic because it's food sourcing that caused this pandemic. But then the other issue, and I think this is really more what you're referring to, Scott, we, we already had these slow motion pandemics of chronic disease that we've been neglecting. So we have pandemic type two diabetes, we have pandemic obesity, we have pandemic hypertension, we have pandemic coronary artery disease, all of which is preventable. And all of that represents a chronic liability. Yeah, those are, those, those siphon years from lives and life from years all the time, but they do it in slow motion. You know, I, I can't warn you about getting type two diabetes in five minutes or next week, you get it over years and decades. And so, you know, everybody's pretty blase about it. Coronary disease develops over years and decades. Cancer develops over years and decades. People don't want to get that stuff, but th th that stuff does not trigger the fight or flight response. COVID does. COVID basically took all of those chronic liabilities and set them on fire. Basically said, no, they're acute liabilities now. If you have obesity, you are at greater risk of getting severely ill with this infection and dying from it. If you have type two diabetes, greater risk of severe infection and death. If you have hypertension, greater risk of severe infection and death. Coronary disease, same thing. So everything that was a chronic liability anyway is now also an acute liability. So the death toll from COVID in the United States is partly attributable to you know, ineptitude in how we've managed the pandemic here. We've done a terrible job, but also partly attributable to the very poor state of chronic health in the country to begin with. Many, many more of us were vulnerable to severe COVID infection than need be because th th this virus infects people pretty routinely, but healthy people have a, a, a very trivial time with it. They, they come through mostly with minimal symptoms or no symptoms. Um, old people have a hard time with it and sick people have a hard time with it. And we've actually, colleagues and I have done a couple papers during the pandemic looking at the distribution of chronic diseases in the population that put us at higher risk for bad COVID outcomes, 60% or more of adults in the United States have at least one of the major risk factors for COVID, 60%, it's incredible. And 40% or more of us have two or more of the major risk factors. So a huge percentage of the population is at elevated risk, not necessary. So yeah, I think, I think COVID basically says everything that was a chronic liability is an acute threat now too. Yeah, it, um, and so, the the one thing is we talk about that, um, I did a little bit of research into how are our oldest uh, folks really around the world doing, ones we know as the blue zones, who have always kind of been the champions of sustained health, right? And, and low incidence of, or at least deferred incidence of chronic disease. They have, I wouldn't say sailed through, but relative to much younger communities, they have been largely untouched, which to yep. me would be, 
a very clear message of this is clearly manageable and we could be addressing this far differently on an individual basis uh, as well. I, I read that, I shared that, and I thank you for answering the question. I didn't answer the question, but I thought to ask it in the early going because, for example, when we, we were waiting for COVID to hit us in the United States, but looking uh, aghast at what was happening in Northern Italy, it, it was pretty clear that this was devastating for people over 70 and 80. Um, and it was devastating for people with severe chronic disease, which is less common in Italy than here, but you know, not exactly rare. But I wondered, gee, I wonder how this would play out in the blue zones where 80 is like 60 everywhere else and where you have to be 100 to, you know, to be like an 80-year-old elsewhere in the world. I, you know, so I wonder if in the blue zones, the cut point for severe COVID infection is an 80, it's 95 or 100 or 102. So I thought to ask the question, but I didn't have the answer. I appreciate that you pulled together the answer and it's pretty much what I expected. So sure, old age puts you at risk because generally old people in our society are sick. There are very few people in our society, a vanishingly small percentage of the population who are over 80 and in robust good health. And, and very few who are over 70 in robust good health. I mean, if 60% of all adults have one or more major chronic disease, and if our risk for chronic disease goes up as we age, you know, you, you quickly get into the realm of a rounding error for the number of people over 80 who are free of major chronic disease. So here in the U.S., in northern Italy, and much of the world, being old generally means being sick and frail, but not so in the blue zones, where again, you know, until your health starts to look like a typical 80-year-old elsewhere in the world, you need to be 105. And your answer was exactly what I was expecting to see. So yeah, age, you know, we're mortal. We all die. Even blue zonians eventually die. They just do it better and they do it later. So age will always be a risk factor for severe infection because our immune system weakens as we age. But at what point you cross the line into the realm of real vulnerability varies with your native health. And in the blue zones, it clearly doesn't happen at 70 and it doesn't seem to happen at 80. And it may not happen until 100. So how would you get to live that lifestyle? It really says in, in any of the work I do is I, I kind of figure I could get almost any reasonable, healthy 50 year old to 90 without doing anything clever at all. Right? Because our work in genetics says really up until 95, genetics has very little to do with it. So, so we kind of say diet is really the number one cause of, of early death. Um, then it begs the question, well, what diet? Right. So I, I've heard you talk about this. So I'll just say, what's the best diet? <laughs> so I, I've wrestled with this more than, than most people through multiple editions of a nutrition textbook. We're, we're, we're working our way through the fourth edition of nutrition and clinical practice right now uh, through many of my other books uh, and uh, a review article commissioned by Annual Review of Public Health in 2014. Can we say what diet is best for health? So, so I, I, I've made identifying best diet, a, a career long crusade before I ever turned it into a business. And th the answer is the basic theme is perfectly clear. Michael Pollan characterized it in seven words, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That's pretty darn good. And that, that's the reason why, you know, everybody remembers it and repeats it. But if you expand that, the basic theme of optimal eating for homo sapiens is real food direct from nature. So not highly processed glow in the dark Franken food or so-called ultra processed food on the Nova scale. We eat way too much of that. Um, and, and by the way, I, I think it's worth noting, Scott, one of the reasons we are able to be confused about diet is because our bodies are so remarkably tolerant. We are natively omnivorous and we are incredibly forgiving machines for a while. So, you know, if you're a giant panda, you have to eat bamboo. If you are a koala bear, you have to eat eucalyptus leaves. You have a very narrow adaptation range. We homo sapiens have this remarkably broad adaptation range where you can put damn near anything in the tank and run for a while. I mean, think of a, a machine where you could throw anything in the tank and it would run. I mean, how incredible that would be. So you have a car, you can put gasoline, it'll go. You put marshmallows, it'll go. You put cheese puffs, it'll go. I mean, it's incredible. We are that incredible. We really are. But it takes a toll. And the toll is a massive, unnecessary burden of chronic disease and premature death. But the toll happens in slow motion. You can run on marshmallows for a while. You can run on jelly beans for a while. You can run on Coca-Cola and cheese doodles. So 
that's why people are confused because, hey, I, you know, I ate cheese doodles today and nothing but cheese doodles and I'm still fine. You know, I'm still standing. Well, yeah, for a while. But if we're, what we're talking about is the value proposition of more years in life, more life in years, the combination of longevity and vitality, resistance to all those chronic diseases that prey on people. The optimal diet for that is real food, not too much, mostly plants, a diet that is mostly made up of minimally or unprocessed fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds, plain water when thirsty. And then in addition to that, less of anything else. Can you append fish to that? Sure, then it's an optimal pescatarian diet. Can you append some meat and poultry and fish and dairy and eggs to that? Sure, then it's an optimal flexitarian diet. Can you append a little bit of meat, a bit more fish, maybe a little bit of poultry, a little bit of fermented dairy and occasional eggs, plus some wine to that? Sure, then it's a Mediterranean diet. Can you do that diet higher or lower in fat? Absolutely, it could be Asian style and low in fat or Loma Linda style, or it could be Mediterranean style with a lot of extra virgin olive oil and high in fat, good either way. Could it be higher or lower in carbohydrate? Sure. Can it be any one of many ethnic variants from all around the world? Absolutely, yes. The basic theme is perfectly clear. A wide variety of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts and seeds, plain water, preferentially when thirsty. Get that right and you're fine. And then everything else around that makes a lesser contribution. It can be vegan. It can be vegetarian. It can be flexitarian, it can be more of a, a mixed diet. The theme is clear. When we get into the realm of is there just one decisively best diet, in general, I'm obligated to say for human health, no. We really don't know whether an optimal vegan diet is better or worse for long-term health outcomes than an optimal Mediterranean diet or an optimal pescatarian diet. I, I would quickly append, though, Scott, there are three things I care about. I care about human health. I'm a physician for that reason. I care about the fate of the planet because I live here and so do my children and so does everybody I know and I don't have another planet to call home. So I care about earth and I care about other creatures. I, I have dogs who are my best friends. There's one right behind me on my chair. Uh, I, I care about uh, my horse, Troubadour. Uh, in general, I, I, you know, I think biodiversity on this planet is its greatest treasure. Uh, so I care about how we treat our fellow creatures. If you look through those three windows, those three lenses, human health outcomes, impacts on the planet, and how we treat our fellow creatures, a plant-exclusive diet wins. So there's a strong argument for the vegan variants, whole food plant-based variants, on the theme of optimal eating, if you want to address not just human health, but human health, planetary health, and our fellow creatures. But, but again, you know, a Mediterranean diet, which is in that general direction without going all the way, is also really, really good. So the theme is clear. There is no one obvious variant that is the decisive winner. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and we, we all see way too much energy getting spent on someone trying to convince My diet can beat your diet, right. And, and everything you heard up until yesterday was wrong. And I have a renegade hypothesis today and by my book, yeah. Right, way too much of that nonsense. So, um, yeah, and, and I think I applaud you every day about kind of, and that's where I try to be. Is let's find some middle road that makes sense. It's not about you know trying to wave the flag, any particular flag. It's just listen to the data, and when you hear enough of it, there's some consistent themes we can start to get behind. That. Absolutely, and and by the way, Scott, to be clear, so I, I founded the True Health Initiative to prove to myself and then demonstrate to the world that leading experts in diet, nutrition, public health, preventive medicine, functional medicine, integrative medicine, lifestyle, holistic care, everything, environmental impact, culinary arts, um, agreed. And, and they agreed about uh, the optimal theme, whether they favored paleo or vegan or Mediterranean or flexitarian or pescatarian or DASH, that, that essentially the fundamentals that unify were more important than the small details that separate, but all we ever talk about in the media is the small details that separate. So the True Health Initiative, which is a 501c3 I created years ago, has a, a global council of directors, roughly 500 world leading experts from 45 countries, paleo to vegan and everything in between coming together to say what we just said, we agree. And the common ground is what matters most. And I think the public deserves to know that, that there's massive expert 
consensus around the entire globe about the fundamental science and sense of Homo sapiens eating well. Yeah, I, th I think if that's, uh, and I'll put the link into True Health Initiative of, of things you've done in your career and you've done some great things. That for me is just like when I look at, at who's on that list and how diverse it is, and those are some people I look to as, as people I, you know, I really respect. Um, that's just a, a I think, a, a tremendous assembly of, of diverse, but all, without exception, all really talented people. So um, thank, thank you, you for that again, because um, you, you probably seem think that's old hat, but uh, uh, everybody's getting introduced to that, to somebody new every day or multiple people every day, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, so you've obviously been studying diet your whole career in terms of all the influences on it. And so you probably, even though I'm assuming you haven't been a diet coach, are keenly aware of the challenges with people trying to make diet improvements, right? Everybody at some point in their life has tried to make some effort at improving my diet. We struggle with, you know, and I ask you know, people in my class, what do you think of your diet? How do you eat? And nine times out of 10, most people say pretty well. Right. That's the typical answer. Yeah. And, and, and so it's almost nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So, so yeah, so we're trying to figure out how to get from here to there. Yeah. And, 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 and we don't know with where, where there is, but where is here? Where is here? Exactly. So I actually have been a diet coach. I, mean, I, I, I did clinical medicine for 30 years. And as a preventive medicine specialist, I, you know, I did primary care internal medicine. I took care of everything. I had patients in the ICU and, and all of that. But you know, people came to me preferentially for advice about health promotion, disease prevention. And we talked an awful lot about diet. So I coached innumerable patients over 30 years about their diet. And was always frustrated with exactly that same thing. I could send them for a 90-minute food frequency questionnaire, or ask them to write down everything they've eaten for the past week, or um, have them do an extensive con consultation with a dietitian who helps them uh, record all of their dietary intake. But by and large, I had no clear idea what they were eating. They told lies to themselves, little white lies. You know, I mean, everybody, just like everybody thinks they're taller than they are and weighs less, everybody thinks they eat better than they do. So. People tell little white lies to themselves and they tell little white lies to their, their physician and health professional. So, you know, I, there was all sorts of distortion. People also routinely substitute the name of a thing for the composition of a thing. So, you know, you'd hear, well, you know, I eat a salad. I don't understand why I'm not thin and healthy. Well, tell me about your salad. Well, it's a chef salad. You know, there's ham and cheese and bologna and croutons and blue cheese dressing. And is there any lettuce in the salad? Well, you know, not very much. Okay, well, I think I think we understand the problem. But you know, what you get is I eat salad for lunch. So yes, absolutely, huge problem. So we we don't tend to know where people are starting. We don't know where here is, and that's been a rate limiting problem for me as a clinician, a rate limiting problem for me as a nutrition researcher, um, a rate limiting problem for me as I consult to industry, and a real frustration for many years. There's an expression, Scott, from the world of business we all know we don't tend to manage what we don't reliably measure. And it's certainly true in medicine. And in fact, in medicine, we epitomize that with vital signs. The things that are critically important to health, the things that are vital, we measure them all the time. And in fact, we are derelict in our professional duties if we don't routinely measure heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, temperature. They are vital. Got to know what they are. Well, the single leading predictor variable of chronic disease and all-cause mortality, as we discussed at the start, is diet quality. That deserves to be a vital sign. We need to know that in everybody. It's too important to neglect. Do we measure it routinely? We do not, because we did not historically have the tools to do it. Yeah, it, um, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge, and it takes so much work, right, for, on a one-on-one -on -one basis to be able to get that in, in um, you know, we we share a friend and colleague, and I want to go to a conversation that uh, that you and I and uh, Dr. Zach Bush had, and you had talked about um, some technology that you have been working on based on all your years of work and all your knowledge and and all those resources that you have around you. Um, that sounded to me just probably one of the one of the coolest and and probably most needed technologies that I've heard of in a long time. Uh, and it's called Diet ID. So, so tell me a little bit about what this is, because I think it gets to the the here and the there thing in a way that that really no one has ever thought of before. 
It does. Yeah. Thank you for the kind intro to it. Uh, and so, you know, after doing my preventive medicine residency at, at Yale, I, I stuck there and, and played various roles on the faculty and directing the Prevention Research Center for the better part of 30 years. I left Yale and academia uh, after nearly 30 years to found Diet ID because I thought it was that important. So, you know, in brief, we, we have reinvented dietary assessment for the digital age. Um, and we did that by taking a completely new and formerly uh, unimagined approach to dietary assessment. You know, if, if I'm trying to figure out what you eat, where is here? So I can figure out where there is and, and essentially do what GPS does. Think of GPS, how incredibly useful it is. We all use it every day. It's fantastic. What does it do? It tells you where you are now. You tell it where you want to go. And it can navigate you from here to there because it knows both here and there. And it can navigate you in a turn list. So, you know, it's not like, okay, here's the general direction, go west, good luck. You know, step by step from here to there. And if you follow those instructions, you will get there and it tracks your progress. Am I going fast? Am I going slow? If I hit a traffic snarl, do I need to reroute? All of that. We invented that for diet. And in order to do that, you know, it, also, it, it has to be pretty much as easy as GPS. I mean, imagine if for your GPS to know where you were, you had to fill out a lengthy questionnaire describing what it looks like around you, and then it tried to guess where you were. It would be horrible. It doesn't do that. It finds you. We do that with Diet ID. So rather than you describing, well, you know, I ate this many servings of pasta over the past six months and had this kind of sauce and this much sauce and uh, ate it this many times a week and gee, let me try to remember what I had for breakfast every day and let me try to remember what I snacked on every day and how often and how much. You'll get all of that wrong. Humans are absolutely terrible at that kind of recollection. We reverse engineered it. We said we, we have vast amounts of information about what people in the real world are eating. Let us create the prototypes of all the different diets from paleo and low carb to low fat, vegan, vegetarian, Mediterranean, typical American, Southern, ethnic, everything. Let's map them all and let's stratify them all by tiers of quality. So for every type of diet in our map, let's have 10 tiers of quality. And what we wound up with for the United States was basically 15 different diet types, 10 tiers of quality, 150 cells. And then for each of those, and I'll spare you the gory details, we created a distinct image that you can look at in a glance. And then what the Diet ID platform does is we learn a little bit about you, it takes a few seconds, literally. We then show you two relevant images and say, which of these looks more like stuff you eat, A or B? You say B, we say, how about now? We say A, we say, how about now? It's exactly like what we all do when we go to the eye doctor. Yep. We use a device there called a foropter. It shows us two images, and the question is, one of these is blurry, one is clearer. Which one's clearer? B. How about now? A. We don't fill out a lengthy questionnaire to get this prescription. We just look at two images at a time, pick the one that's in focus, and we do that one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. It takes 30 seconds, and we get an exact match for our eyes in diopters. We've done that for diet, and we provide an exact match for your diet using an objective measure of diet quality, the Healthy Eating Index 2015. It's a 100-point scale. It correlates robustly with all-cause mortality and total chronic disease risk. And we can report that information back to you or to your health professional in about 60 seconds. Ordinarily, it would take you know, 90 minutes for you to complete a food frequency questionnaire, which would then first need to be submitted and analyzed. And maybe a week later, you'd get back your, your scores and your nutrient intake and your Healthy Eating Index score. We can do all of it in 60 seconds. Diet type, diet quality objectively measured, estimates of 150 nutrient intake levels. That's here. We manage what we measure. Diet needs to be a vital sign. We've invented the tool to make it so. Yeah, it, so there were, there were many aspects of this that I thought were just, just brilliant. Um, one of them was, again, to kind of go back on the, the user side um, and, and that importance of meeting people where they are. So, and I'll flash some, some screenshots up here of what that looks like, but it, what it reminded me of was someone standing at the counter at a fast food, because we, they know that's how people buy now, right? They want to see a meal of whatever. And right. so they look up and that's, so that's something people can relate to very quickly rather than on the list of, you know, nothing looks nearly as appealing in black and white on a list or even in a menu, unless you have a picture with them. Suddenly it's like, okay. Um, yeah, that it, the, the engagement, I think, is, is so much higher as a result of that. I've never seen anything like it. 
Thank you. No, it, it's it's extremely differentiated intellectual property. No question. Nobody's ever done anything like it. We, we've searched diligently. You know, when we were filing our various patent applications, um, and and so you know, again, it was partly inspired by the the eye doctor experience. It was partly inspired by Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, uh, a book that tells us we're really really good at being right with a quick reaction at a glance. Humans are excellent at pattern recognition. We tend to do really badly when we bog down in details and everything about dietary recollection bogs us down in details. Diet ID says, no, take a look at this image, which looks right. And then you're absolutely right, Scott, about meeting people where they are, both because we've mapped all the different kinds of diets in, in the, the whole population, but we do the four things that GPS does at Diet ID. So we find you now, we help you identify where you want to go. We navigate you from here to there with what we call behavioral navigation one step at a time, and we track your progress. But with the navigation, and, and, and this is the reason, by the way, we call it behavioral navigation as opposed to behavior modification. Behavior modification sounds like you're broken and I'm here to fix you. Behavioral navigation is like GPS. You're the boss. You decide where you want to go. We can tell you which diets are best based on your health goals. Do you want to lower your weight? Do you want to lower your blood pressure? Do you want to prevent diabetes? Do you want to treat heart disease? You tell us. We'll tell you here are the four diets that are best for that. But then you pick the one that you want. So there are really two things that matter in, in personalizing nutrition. And Diet ID can truly personalize nutrition. One is, what are you trying to fix? And two is, how do you want to eat? You put those two things together, that is a really powerful formula for personalization. And then we help you determine how far do you want to go. So let's say you settle on the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet or a vegan diet, whatever it is. You may not be ready to go to tier 10, the highest quality version. That may look too hard, too far away. You know, just like, you know, I, I want to go to the mountains, but I don't want to go to the Himalayas. Too, you know, I know they're really cool, but too far away. You know, I mean, the, the Appalachians will do or, or the Adirondacks, right? little mountains nearby. Same thing with diet. I want to do better. There's a place I want to go. There's a direction I want to go in. But, you know, I can't scale Mount Everest yet. So don't take me to tier 10. Tier 7 looks right. I'm starting in tier 3. Tier 7 is massively better, but it looks to me like it's within reach. I could do that. So we, we, we meet people where they are in that regard, too and help identify for them a destination that feels right, that feels comfortable, that feels doable. And, and I think anybody who knows much about um, evolving habits in humans says, we, we need constant reminders, constant reinforcement. And so what I see of this is the feedback coming from it is measured progress on a regular basis versus, and, and the other part of this, I think in all of this, when you put it together is really addressing what I assume is traditionally a really high failure rate. So if I'm a healthcare professional and I'm, you know, people are coming to me, they want, they want an outcome, but I'm guessing this is gonna totally change the, the success rate. We'll talk about success rate versus failure rate. Everything about Diet ID is, is I think, perfectly designed to do exactly that. And our, our early experiences are very gratifying. But I think we should quickly append, Scott, uh, another reference to our, our friend Dan Butner and, and the Blue Zones. In those places around the world where people routinely eat well and routinely enjoy the combination of more years in life, more life in years, longevity and vitality, it's not because of an app. It's not because of doctors providing great counseling. It's not because of anything the clinical system does. It's because their culture makes it normal. And I, I would argue, even as the inventor of an innovation in dietary assessment and, and behavioral navigation, which I believe is extremely important and, and tremendously valuable, I don't think that's where things should stop. I think ultimately, it's a problem that America runs on Dunkin'. It's a problem that multicolored marshmallows are considered a part of a child's complete breakfast in this country. It's a problem that the national hydration beverage is Coke or Pepsi. Those are problems. And, and it's a problem that we need a Nova scale to tell us about ultra processed Franken food because there's so much of it around. All of that's a problem. So I, I think diet ID should be the place where we get a handle on where are we now? Where should we be? How big is the divide? And let's help individuals get here from there. But what I would really like to see ultimately is a cultural revolution. There's no reason why we can't all be blue zones but we've got a long way to go. And I, you know, I, I argued when I was president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, lifestyle is the best medicine. 
if we think about a spoon to make the medicine go down, Lord knows it's not a spoonful of sugar. We don't need more of those. It's culture. Culture is the big spoon. Clinics can do so much, but the big spoon is, is culture. On the other hand, with a tool like Diet ID, we, we can disseminate this into our culture so everybody has access to this empowering assessment. They know what their diet is. They can compare it to what they want it to be, and they can start moving that direction. So, yes, we're, we're definitely a big part of the ultimate success we want to achieve, um, but I'm advocating for a cultural revolution. Food should be nourishing. The, the, the idea that we can talk about junk food is oxymoronic, give or take the oxy. Junk is not food, food is not junk. Our culture needs to reject that notion. Yeah, I think, uh, well, we've seen probably over the, the last 18 months, finally some of the, the big medical uh, organizations coming out with some statements that, that they've been pressured to for some time, but the pressure against saying anything. If you talk to to any of the physicians in our circles, they all kind of are all in agreement, but yet you hear the statement coming out, you know, where they talk about AMA, American Heart right. Association, it's kind of like, who put that out? <laughs> well, in fact, you can just go to the conferences. You know, the American Heart Association is likely to serve bacon, eggs, and donuts and Danish for, for breakfast. You know, I mean, they got basically, you know, all the, the world's leading experts in cardiovascular medicine lined up to get their bacon and donuts. It's absurd. So, yeah, I mean, the divide between what we know and what we do about it has been huge. But as you say, that's changing. So, you know, just recently, there was a position statement in circulation, one of the more prestigious medical journals, by a standing committee of the American Heart Association saying that diet is the leading predictor of all-cause mortality. It's the leading predictor of cardiovascular outcomes. It should be captured in every clinical encounter, stored in every electronic health record, and we need tools that can do it. And we actually, we promptly met with the head of that committee to say we have that tool. Uh, you're right, the world needs the tool, and we have the tool. And um, that's our ambition. We want to make diet a vital sign. Um, we offer a means by which diet could absolutely be captured as universally as blood pressure. Who all can be clients of Diet ID software? We, we are what's called a B2B company. So we, we, we license to business entities or organizations, health systems, health coaches, clinical practices, individual practitioners can be our clients, but we don't license directly to the consumer. We're not in the app store. And, and that's for one very important reason. The diet space is massively cluttered. We're really different, but if you are one of thousands and thousands of diet apps in the app store, the average consumer is going to have a very hard time knowing that you're different. It's very easy when we talk to health professionals to explain in just a few minutes how radically different we are. But interestingly, um, we've had tremendous response from consumers. During the COVID pandemic, we made the tool freely available so people could get a handle on what is my diet now? What should it be for optimal immunity? And, and what do I need to change to get there from here? And I actually had the opportunity to mention this briefly on uh, the show of my friend Mehmet Oz. So I went on the Dr. Oz show to talk about a few things related to nutrition and COVID. And at the end, he asked me, so, you know, I know you're involved with this innovation diet ID. Tell us about it. So I did and said, and, you know, we're offering this free, free platform. The response from Dr. Oz show viewers broke our server. Thousands and thousands of people rushed to our website to, to get access to the tool. And so we had, we had to scramble to, you know, basically amplify our, our bandwidth so we could handle the traffic. I think when it was said and done, 16,000 people used our, our um, service that day. Many of them were, you know, older people, many even over 80. 96% of people who just went to our website completed the full assessment. It's that's easy. It's that easy. I mean, that's, that's unheard of. So, you know, basically people go to a website, and, eh, forget it. 96% of everybody of the 16,000 who went to the site completed the, uh, the entire assessment, got their diet assessment, compared it to what would be better for their immune function. Um, so there is consumer demand, but it, just in terms of business efficiency, we're interested first in transforming the so-called health system. So we're, we are licensing to major health systems, to health coaches, clinical practices. We're interested in concierge medicine, cardiac rehab programs, uh, diabetes prevention programs, diabetes management programs, on and on it goes, worksite wellness. And then we have a number of other deployments as well because we're actually relevant in one way or another, every place people, food and nutrients come together. So our, our market is vast. But for now, at least, we are a B2B 
a company, not a not a B to C. We're not selling directly to consumer. Right. How about uh, for large or medium or large companies? Is that something you're set up? To Absolutely. Yeah. No. We, we we so we we've we've already deployed uh, to over forty clients, um, varying in size from from small to medium to very large. Uh, and a number of those deployments are worksite wellness. So essentially, you know, any given business that has a significant number of employees that are subject to the slings and arrows of uh, outrageous epidemiologic misfortune living in the modern world, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, coronary disease, et cetera. So we are relevant there. Um, we're relevant to the individual employees because we help them transform their health in ways they want but we're highly relevant to the employer because we're extremely inexpensive. And we are an incredibly economical means for them to address these chronic disease risks related to diet and potentially save a ton of money because obviously a huge cost center for every employer is the healthcare costs of their workforce. If we can move that needle for them, we can save them vastly more money than we need to charge them. So everybody wins. The employee gets better health, the employer, actually improves their bottom line, and Diet ID can be a highly profitable business. We estimated, by the way, Scott, that the dietary assessment business in the United States, as it exists today, using really bad tools that everybody hates, is about $1.7 billion a year. And we've estimated that it costs, on average, about $80 to complete a dietary assessment. And that doesn't take into account your time. So if, if you spend 90 minutes filling out a food frequency questionnaire or you spend a week completing a food journal, we don't count your time as valuable at all. That's totally discounted. I don't think that's right, but that's how it's done. We only count the time of a health professional analyzing what you submit. And we estimate that costs on average $80. Diet ID can do a better job for two orders of magnitude less. I mean, and, and, and you know, massively less time. And it, so it, it really is transformational. Yeah. It, uh... Well, I don't think you could have timed it better. Uh, yeah, what, what, well, the one thing that wasn't great about the timing is we started licensing this, selling it, um, just as the pandemic hit. And, yeah. and actually, uh, surprisingly, in some ways, we've continued to do um, brisk sales during the pandemic. But there was a disruption because, you know, we were near to closure with some large health systems. And then COVID hit and, you know, the people we were talking to who were due to sign contracts said, sorry, we've been diverted. We're, we're, we're spending all our time devising our COVID response policy. And it introduced a delay of months. So, that, so other than the pandemic, in general, the timing was perfect. The pandemic, you know, was not terrific timing, but, you know, we're, we're, we're navigating through these choppy waters. Yeah, well, that's good. I have the same thing in terms of video education and things that this has been my world in terms of video conferencing for years since its earliest days. Um, yeah, it's good to see everybody else getting there. That's right. You have a lot of company. We'll make our life easier. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that that's great, uh, David. I just um, I, I really thank you. This was a great opportunity to get a, a better hands-on feel for it. Um, it is it is just so exciting to to see this happening. Um, it um, and I couldn't think of anyone I would want directing it than you. Well, that's very kind. We're really excited about it too. We, 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 we believe passionately that diet should be a vital sign. If we can play a, a meaningful role in making it so, we'll be deeply gratified. So I appreciate that very much, Scott, and this opportunity to talk about that and, and, and other things. And for anybody wanting to know more specifically about Diet ID, it's easy. Visit dietid.com. And if you want more information, there are instructions there about who to contact, and we'll be happy to help you out. So if I'm an um, employee at a company or uh, you know, working it for a, uh, a medical practitioner, what, what would you suggest? I'm going to go to the website to check it out. Am I better to kind of take that to my leadership or how would you, you guide people? Yeah, on you've got several options. So again, we're not, we're not putting the app in the app store for you to use individually, but you could access it either through a worksite wellness deployment. So share it with the head of HR. Uh, or you know whoever in the food chain where, where you work makes those kinds of decisions, um, or with your health professional because we do license the technology to clinical practices and an individual practitioner. So your doctor, your health coach, can have access to this. They can license it from us, and then they 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 actually have an administrative portal that gives them detailed information. But you interact with the app and get all the information you need. So either through your health professional or your employer, either way, uh, there's an opportunity for you to pass information along, send those people to us, 
and my team will take good care of them. Terrific. That sounds, uh, that sounds like a must do right now. <laughs> well, thank you very much, David. Uh, great to talk to you again and about something that's, uh, that's truly cutting edge. That's uh, those of us in research, we always like stuff right out on the, right out on the pointy edge. So that's where you've been living your whole career too. So thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Stay well, my friend. You too. Take care, David.